Associate Professor Peter Detsko from Aarhus University. Thank you. Thank you also to, um, uh, to our gracious host for inviting us here today. It's a great privilege and a pleasure to be able to give this talk. It's also a slightly daunting task given the rich and eye-opening keynotes that we've had, but fortunately I only have to talk about one particular concept. And the concept I'll talk about today is one that's been fundamental in helping us understand how and why humans, technology and society are interwoven and how they co-evolve. This concept is known as socio-technical systems. And as indicated by the subtitle of my talk, I'll also discuss uh, in, in some degree who's in the driver's seat, humans or technology. Let me start out with an example of how we experience important and meaningful moments, how we share these moments with others, and how quickly our practices around experiencing and sharing moments can change. We go back in time a bit. The year is 2005. We're in Peter Square in the Vatican City in Rome. The old Pope, John Paul, has passed away. A papal conclave has been held and the Cardinals have elected a new Pope, Benedict. And here we are in the middle of Peter Square, just at the point in time in which the new Pope is being presented. This is what it looked like when you were in the middle of the crowd. Many of these people had traveled a long way to be here for this important moment in time, sharing it with others around them. Now, we jump forward in time. Eight years, we're in the same situation. And as these things go, a new pope has been elected, Benedict has resigned, Pope Francis has been elected by the cardinals. This is the same situation, the same spot. Eight years have passed. What has happened in between? Well, at least it seems as if the way of experiencing the moment, of sharing it with others, has changed in quite drastic ways. And we know, of course, that one of the things that had happened in between uh, 2005 and 13 was the introduction of the iPhone, and alongside that, the rollout of uh, ubiquitous internet access. As technology spreads into and affects ever more spheres of human activity and experience, it becomes important also to integrate our understandings uh, of humans and of society into the development of technology if it is to be meaningful and relevant to us. The concept of socio-technical systems has played a central role in, in shaping how we think about these things. It's also greatly influenced my field of research. I have a background in the humanities and I now work in the hybrid field known as human-computer interaction, which means that I'm exactly interested in what happens when humans and computers meet and in developing new technologies that can bring the two meaningfully together. It's people in, in my field who are responsible for all the interfaces you encounter when you use digital systems, be it your smartphones, your fitness trackers on your wrist, your GPS in your car, your voice-activated smart speakers in your home, and so on. And the, so, the, the concept of socio-technical uh, socio systems has also been very influential in, in, in shaping this entire field. In today's talk, I wish to make three points that build upon insights from uh, the social technical systems perspective. One is that techno technological and social aspects are tightly interwoven and that they co-evolve. The second is that technology influences and shapes what we see in the world, how we see it, how we think about ourselves and others, how we communicate, and how we act and create new things in the world. And finally, that the humanities and social sciences can come to play a crucial role in the development of information technology in the future. As per the instructions given by our hosts, I'll only talk briefly about the past and the origins and roots of social technical systems theory, and then I'll move to more towards discussing what this perspective has meant for how we view the world today and what it can come to mean in the future. But let's get on with the with the first of these points. We jump into the time machine once more. We go back to 1946. We're in London in the wake of the Second World War, and here the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations is established. And one of the main objectives of the Tavistock Institute is to carry out workplace studies and figure out how to organize work in more efficient and optimal ways so that Great Britain can be rebuilt after the war. One of the things that sets the Tavistock Institute apart from many other endeavors is that they rely on a large, to a large extent uh, on methods from the humanities and social sciences, such as social psychology and ethnography. They carry out a number of workplace studies, beginning in industry, studying in depth how coal miners organize their workplace and what happens when new technologies become introduced. And over the next couple of decades, Eric Trist, who's a longtime chairman uh, of the Tavistock Institute and his partners, 
uh, develop what is known as social technical systems theory. And the basic premise of their work is that social and technical aspects of an organization are a complex whole, and they're so closely related that we must think of them as one system. This also means that if you want to go out and try to, to tune or, or, or develop a more optimal working organization, then you need to develop the social and the technical sides in concert. This is known as the principle of joint optimization. The Tavistock Institute also strongly promote the idea that if you want to do so, then you need to go out, carry out studies in order to, uh, to develop a rich and deep understanding of the end users. That is to say, the people who will end up living with and using the technology that is being developed. They also promote the idea that in order, that in order to do so, it can be a very good idea to involve end users in technology design. And this is something that has had a great uptake in how we think about and develop technology today. In Scandinavia, it came to be the roots of the participatory design tradition, and you've probably also heard of concepts such as user-driven innovation, design thinking, and so on. From our present-day perspective, it can sound self-evident that the two are intertwined, but in my view, we can also see this as an indicator of the impact that this early research has had. Because we have to understand that the prevailing understanding of organizations at the time was radically different. They, bluntly put, they were based on the idea that an organization was a piece of machinery and the, that you could analyze, recombine, and fine-tune uh, the components, take them apart and put, put them back together again, and that the human worker was just co one component in this system, a cog in the machinery as brilliantly exemplified by Charlie Chaplin in, in modern times. It's also a perspective that even though we may think of it as self-evident, that is still highly relevant today, do we have any politicians in the audience? No. Let's say that you want to create a more efficient healthcare system and that a new technology has emerged that could potentially help you do so. Social technical systems theory tells us that it would be a really good idea to go out, study and understand in depth how key professionals in the current work practices actually carry out their work, what their relations are and how they use technology now and that preferably you should also try to involve these people in actually shaping the new techno-social or social technical system. Otherwise, you might end up with a system that is inefficient and that causes frustration and breakdowns. Now, one to my second point, which is that in a social technical perspective, technology is not just a blunt instrument for carrying out actions in the world that we have already preconceived and thought out in our minds. Technology influences and shapes what we see, how we think about it, how we communicate, how we act and create new things. The example from before from Peter Square, I think, aptly demonstrates that some technologies frame how we view the world. A further insight is that once a technology has been introduced to us, it also influences how we think about what we can see in the world. And by already having this technology at hand, we are more susceptible to going out and looking for particular things in the world because these technologies enable us to do so. Many of you, I, I suppose, probably also know this from the analogy of the hammer and the nails, which states that if the only tool you have at hand is a hammer, then every problem starts to look like a nail, and you think of obvious ways of, of solving those problems. We can also see this across a range of other fields with deeper implications. Um, I'm the director of a recently founded centre at Aarhus University called the Centre for Digital Creativity, and one of the domains that we've studied and collaborated with uh, for quite some time now is architecture. And in architecture, we can also see the implications of the hammer and nail analogy. The technologies that architects have at hand influence how they think about what architecture is and what it could be. This is clear both in studying their work practices, but also in observing the end results. As new technologies emerge, they change the way of thinking. Architects' ideas about what architecture is change and co-evolve with technology. And in return, some architects develop new tools to see and think in new ways. Another one of our findings when we look out across a range of domains is that if we look at the avant-garde, at the front runners, across many domains, all the way from the performing arts to the science labs, then we see that many of these front runners, they don't just use the tools that are given to them, they find new and clever ways to hack them, they use them for unintended purposes, and they create new tools. And they do so in order to be able to discover new things in the world, to experiment in ways that were not possible before, and to think things that were previously unthinkable. 
Personally, I'm tremendously fascinated with how we can work across the humanities and other disciplines such as computer science to explore and, and, and develop new digital tools to augment our uh, capabilities for discovering, for creating and, and thinking in new ways. This is a relatively yeah, unexplored domain, perhaps because it falls between the cracks of, of traditional disciplines uh, of research, but in a social technical perspective, it is also one that holds great untapped potential. Technology also influences how we see ourselves. It becomes a mirror for us. To an increasing extent, we see our bodies through the metrics provided by fitness trackers and wearables, and we see our social relations via computational metrics such as likes, mentions, and retweets. In the beginning, we shaped computers in our image, and we named them after human cognitive capabilities. We called the first computers electronic brains, electroniana in Danish. Uh, today, we built neural networks, and we call our devices smart and intelligent. But in return, we also come to see and understand ourselves in the image of the computer. Part of our understanding of what it means to be human becomes shaped by what it means to be a computer. And now we arrive at the third point, um, and this point I want to make is that the technologies and, and social sciences could and should have a crucial role to play in the development of future technology, because I think it's simply too important and too complex to leave solely in the hands of technologists. One of the iconic statements about our relationship to technology is attributed to Marshall McLuhan, saying uh, that we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And in my view, that's rather an optimistic take in the sense that here it is after, after all first we that shape the tools, so we have a high degree of agency even if we then uh, distribute agency to tools afterwards. But this is not necessarily how it happens in practice. If we look out at the world today, most of us are not tool makers. We're tool users or consumers. So if I were to, uh, to look at this statement again today, maybe we should rewrite it in this way. Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, and so on shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. And we're beginning to realize that this reach is beyond the individual. It can affect some of the fundamental components and dynamics of society. Perhaps a more apt way of putting it is like Douglas Rushkoff did his, in his uh, 2010 book called Program or Be Programmed. This has made uh, its way into public discourse. We now discuss notions such as computational literacy. Should we teach our kids how to code in schools? I most definitely think we should. But based on what I've said today, I most definitely also think that we should strive to improve our social technical literacy of figuring out how the two are intertwined. Now for this audience today, I think the most definite is good news. IT development has moved into fields that we in the humanities have decades, centuries, and in some cases, millennia of experience in working in. We have the opportunity to play a much larger role in this. I'd even go so far as to say that we have an obligation to do so. And what I find when, uh, in, in many of our collaborations with computer science, scientists and, and engineers is that there is a distinct opening towards collaboration with the humanities and an interest in bringing these perspectives to the table. Now, collaboration is not always easy. There can be disciplinary aspects that hold us back, and speaking from the experience of working across faculties, there can definitely also be institutional, political, and organizational barriers in place. But also in addressing this crowd, I'd say who better to break down the barriers than the group of people assembled here today? I don't have much time for nuances, because I want to wrap this up, but very bluntly put, the humanities have traditionally been very strong in articulating how and why we got to where we are now and are offering nuanced and critical understandings of our present state of affairs. So one of the major challenges uh, now and in the future lie in employing our perspectives and understandings constructively to figure out how to create meaningful alternatives to the present state of affairs and to shape desirable futures. The humanities are many things, and there isn't one clear answer for how to do this, but one of the ways forward could be uh, through mutual collaborations with our colleagues in the STEM disciplines, science, tech, engineering, and, and math. We need to engage in and actively seek out these opportunities, and we need to do what we can to create even better opportunities for our younger colleagues and peers to, to work in new forms of, of uh, hybrid disciplinary collaboration. This is often referred to as STEAM, as of integrating the arts with the STEM disciplines. If the social technical perspective is, is anything to go by, I'd say there are great opportunities for us. The humanities have the opportunity to play a central role in developing a meaningful and livable social technical future. There's also much work for us to do, so let's get going. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We have a question? One question I have, a very specific and short question here. So what I missed in your talk a little bit was the notion of digital tool criticism. Yeah. So I fully agree that um, 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 in order to you know, really uh, be active ourselves in, in the development of tools, you have to become a programmer. But without being a programmer, you could also start criticizing tools, although this might become a new field, yeah? tool criticism. I, yeah. I mean, the term is around, but it's still not yet a discipline. Nope. What do you think? This could be actually one of the role of the humanities, to, to actually teach digital tool criticism. What about that? I think you're absolutely right. But I also think, I mean, listening to, to the talks today, that this is not just something that should occur or already occurred just in the humanities. Many of my colleagues in computer science are doing exactly that. Working with these uh, advanced concepts, um, developing the conceptual frameworks for tool criticism is something that I see as something that has to unfold across the disciplines. It can most definitely be uh, something that we can do in the humanities, but it is already occurring also in, for instance, computer science. Yeah. So we should try to reappropriate it? So we can... I don't know. I, I think we should collaborate with these people. Uh, yeah, and, and find new forums that, that reach across. I mean, one of, the, one of the challenges of working in this field, of, of course, is that you feel kind of like a French humanist, but you most definitely don't feel like a, a computer scientist. So finding forums in which these debates are encouraged and appreciated. Yeah. Our last question goes to Dr. O'Neill. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be a little bit critical of your cyber romanticism. Yeah. <laughs> Please be. I think that the point we have reached with technological developments now yeah. is one of um, some very large monopolies yeah. that are not responsive to any legislative agenda whatsoever, controlling these technologies. All your examples were of consumer advantage which is, of course, the card they play. But the public sphere requires more than consumer advantage. And there is also the issue of the social and democratic cost of tolerating this level of monopoly in technical provision. And then exporting that into other areas of life is pretty risky. Our response? I absolutely agree. <laughs> um, I hope I haven't e expressed uh, an opposing view. I think that there are major challenges facing us today. Many of these companies have grown at such an explosive rate that legislation haven't, hasn't caught up. And most of these companies un operate from very particular perspectives. If, if we take this list and, and we exclude Alibaba from the list, then you could say that most of them operate from a venture-backed capitalist Southern Californian male perspective. Um, they embody a very particular way of thinking about what it means to, to communicate with other people, um, how we establish collaboration, how we see ourselves. There are many, many, many issues to, to address, and this is also why I think it's, as I said, it's, it's too important to, to leave in the hands of these people. I'm also sometimes a bit dismayed by the fact that it seems very hard to, at, at the present point in time, to establish any, any credible, uh, credible counter, uh, counter movement to this. This could be something that, for instance, you could consider in the European Union uh, as, as one, of, one of our perspectives, because what I see being built up in, in China more or less replicates it, and there it just gets interwoven even more tightly with, uh, with surveillance from, uh, from government. Thank you very much, Peter Thank you.